I just wanna say at the top of this video, before any of you know which winners I put in my top five, in an alternate universe, none of these players would be winners if these performances had anything to do with their victory. But thankfully we live in this timeline and so everything I say here doesn't really matter. These players all found success regardless of what I think. By the way, ladies and gents, my name is Perdium. Welcome, hello. I've spent a lot of time lately discussing the worst final tribal performances and I figured it's only fair that I take shots at some millionaires too. Or 600,000 heirs after Obama takes his cut. Number five. This is gonna be a spicy top five for those who are unprepared. Number five is a fan favorite winner who I almost didn't include in this vid if only because I liked their performance outside of like one questionable answer. Number five is Ethan from season three, Survivor Africa. Here's the deal. After rewatching 40 final tribals, most winners have decent to good performances and a lot of what determined this top five was splitting hairs. As for Ethan, like 80% of his answers weren't bad. I love his answer when he lists the five main traits that a survivor player needs. But the 20% that got him in this top five is not just his answer to Brandon's question, but how he answers it too. Going into this final tribal, Ethan tells us that he believes the vote is going to be close, probably four to three, and he thinks he has Lex, Tom, and Frank, and that Kim has T-Bird, Kim P, and Kelly. So it's gonna come down to Brandon's vote. Brandon asks Ethan which juror doesn't deserve to be there, and Ethan coldly just says, says you. Brandon isn't flattered. And when Brandon goes to vote for Kim to win, he cites Ethan's answer for the reason why he is not voting for him because Ethan bashed Brandon on his own question. Simply put, I think there was a better way Ethan should have answered this. It was definitely a negative question intended to potentially lose a jury vote, but Kim finessed the same question by targeting a juror she knew wasn't going to vote for her. Ethan wasn't sure who Brandon was voting for, so hitting him with that answer did him no favors. Based Based on Ethan's analysis with where he thought the votes were going, this could have cost him the game. It didn't, but I still think a little more tact would have gone a long way. Also, when Kelly asked the final two for them to pick a number between one and a thousand, I am fairly sure that Kelly was always voting for Ethan, regardless of which number he picked. I wanted to know who you thought deserved to set up there the least out of the seven of us. Um, you. I totally was gonna vote for Ethan without even thinking about it. But you know what? Ethan was so stupid, he slammed me on my own question. Kim's just as deserving as Ethan, and it's kind of cool that a 56-year-old woman did really well, so... And she didn't slam me on my own question. Dumb, Ethan, so stupid. Number four. I initially didn't anticipate this winner being in my top five, but after careful analysis, I think they should be here. Number four is Denise from season 25, Survivor Philippines. This is going to be a more subtle set of reasons for having her this high, but it starts with her opening speech, where she says that she is not apologetic for being in the final three, only to then later apologize for some things that she said to Abby. It's a small criticism, but I don't think the conviction was there. Likewise, the apology that she gives to Abby doesn't really feel sincere if only because she does the whole if I offended you blah 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 instead of just owning what she said. Based on her wording, the implication is that she's not even sure if Abby is being honest, which I think you should just assume if you want to win her over. Denise did still get Abby's vote though, so it's not a big deal. But when she responds to Pete, again, I take issue with some of the wording with her answer. She basically slams the entire Tandang tribe for being dumb and inept and not targeting her earlier in the merge. She's not wrong, but how she says it made me wonder if she could have said it in a better way. But the worst part is her response to Malcolm, a question I think she bombs regarding how she outplayed Lisa and Scoopin. She gets hung up on countering Malcolm's criticism of her, trying to appease everyone all the time, and her answer, as Malcolm states, isn't sufficient. She defends her behavior of appeasement, but Malcolm was looking for how she outplayed her opponents, not a defense, and her retort to that is weak. It's surprisingly vague. She just doesn't have a lot to say outside of how she survived every tribal, and for all that, I put her in my top five. Denise, you needed to come, don't nod. I'm telling you right now, don't nod. This appeasing everybody thing has to stop, but now I wanna hear how how you played better than why you deserve it more. There's also value in just listening and observing to what people say. That's a part of who I am that I couldn't not bring into the game. So it may seem appeasing, but I was playing the game every step of the way. And I'm sitting here 
and you're standing there. You got hung up on one word. That's not what I asked at all. Number three. I think there's a noticeable gap with this top three from the rest. And I also think that some people will be surprised when I say that number three is Tony 1.0's performance in season 28, Survivor Kageon. Yes, Tony crushed Rue in the final vote and many saw it coming, but man, does this final tribal do him no favors. Every time I've rewatched this season with people who have never seen it before, they always start to think that Tony is gonna blow the lead he had going into this final tribal because of how questionable his performance here is. Tony is very defensive and one note, and it is surprising given how dynamic he was throughout the season. He had a lot to touch upon, but instead goes back to the same empty well of justification that no juror was looking for. He doesn't seem to own his game at times, such as when he talks with Jeffra and tries to turn the tables on her, explaining why he ethically felt comfortable going against her. Jeffra is not satisfied. LJ asks Tony who he really is, but Tony just does the same thing as he did with Jeffra. He tries to justify why LJ was in the wrong and deserved to be voted out. Because LJ was willing to break a promise or whatever, it, it doesn't really matter. Tony, that's not what he's looking for. This tells the jurors that Tony only ever reacted and wasn't a villain, but that's not true. We have it on tape and it's okay to lie, Tony. It's fine. It's Survivor. You just gotta own it, which you're not doing here. You're blaming everyone else for your behavior. And then we get the Trish speech, which has Tony again trying to justify his decision to blindside her. Ah, oh, the yes or no question. She just wants a yes or no answer. And dang it, y'all, if a juror just wants a yes or a no, give them a yes or a no. Anything more and you will start to bury yourself. If you are sitting in the final three or the final two, you are going to feel like you are six feet under at final tribal. And in some cases with some jurors, the only thing you can do to help yourself from not digging a deeper hole is to say less. But Tony kept digging and I think it was the other 38 days of his gameplay that got him this win. Not so much what we saw on night 39. Was it worth it to you for a million dollars to sacrifice your own father to get you here. Was that worth it to you? Trish, I was outnumbered when Wu came up to me. He had Spencer, he had Tosh. I asked you Tosh. a question. Is it worth it to you to be here to play a game for a million dollars on your father's soul and memory? Yes or no? It's a million dollar question. Yes. Number two. This is gonna be a weird one. Number two, the Iceman cometh. It's Brian from season five, Survivor Thailand. And I already know some people are gonna hit me with the, but Peridium, Brian knew he had the four votes locked. He didn't try with the other three. And isn't that brilliant? No, it's not brilliant. It's barely enough. And all it took was one rogue vote to bring him to his knees. This was not exemplary or optimal day 39 gameplay. It was coasting on 38 days of total dominance. Basically, would it really hurt for Brian to try to at least appease the other three jurors? Brian is inauthentic with Ken's question, totally throws it away and doesn't even bother to salvage that vote. Penny wants to know how much Brian knew about her and his answers are so pathetic and so revealing. Could the master of his domain not sweet talked his way out of this or at least tried? Brian's entire performance up until Helen roasts him is all about how capable of a provider he was around camp. It resonates for some, but it leaves a lot to be desired as far as good final tribals go. And then he does to Helen what Tony was doing. His justification for taking her out was over a mistake that he made, but instead of being apologetic, he starts with blaming her. Given she calls him the epitome of a used car salesman, you would think that he would try to subvert that. It's only after she continues to get annoyed with him that he begins to get humble and turn it around. And while I don't love a lot of what he's been saying up to this point, despite him being my number two here, I do like how he ends his interaction with Helen as he says, you should vote for me because I made one mistake for a truth that I admit, an apology. And he finally salvaged this hot mess by complimenting her and admitting he believed she was good enough to take him out. Iceman, the lake was thawing. You were on mighty thin ice for a second there. Brian, do you know where I grew up? In Texas. Do you know where in um, Texas? I want to say uh, Beaumont, somewhere Beaumont, Texas. That would be Jam. Do I have any siblings? And if I do, what are their names? You've got an older brother or an older sister. No, I'm the oldest. You're the oldest, OK. Ken, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Brian told you something. Well, Brian just told me two different things, which neither one of them are what he told me when this was originally done. Yeah when we were originally talking about it. Did you get the honesty? No, I did not. Number one, 
Well, this shouldn't be a surprise. Number one, the worst final tribal council performance by a Survivor winner goes to Todd from season 15, Survivor, I'm kidding. Y'all, I'm kidding, it's Bob from season 17, Gabon. Bob, Bob, Bob. Not Todd. Let's start with the good. He gives Charlie, Corinne, and Randy pretty much what they want to hear. Not perfect, but it's nice to see my number one on this list have some upside. Charlie was happy, Corinne felt good enough, and I guess Randy was, shall we say, displeased the least with Bob after telling all three finalists to kiss his ass. As for the other jurors, I have questions. Crystal criticizes Susie for being a coattail writer and then asks Bob what he did on his own that wasn't controlled by sugar and he says he didn't do anything on his own. He literally says he rode coattails to reach the end. As you might expect, Crystal is not satisfied. Kenny then asks Bob about their deal to give up immunity. Bob defends his actions of not giving it up, but Kenny retorts by saying that wasn't what he wanted to hear. And this is a tricky one. I get where Bob is coming from logically, but clearly Bob's answers weren't satisfactory. And just like the previous winners on this list, I got to imagine there is a way to please Kenny despite the raw deal Bob was getting. Bob, you've already said you rode coattails all season. Just tell Kenny he's right and then wipe away any crocodile tears with the million dollars you're about to win. When Maddie asks him why Sugar or Susie are are more deserving, he straight up says they aren't, and while I like that, I kinda wonder if he could have said more to ensure they wouldn't win. With that question, there is definitely more to be said, but Bob doesn't really have anything to say. But perhaps worst of all was his answer to Marcus. Marcus asked Bob to tell him one example where he took responsibility for his own decisions, a fair question, and Bob says it never happened. He never took control. He never needed to. Says everyone else is making good decisions, so he never needed to step in. But y'all, oh my god, this is such a layup of a question from a vote Bob already had locked up anyway. And if you really think about it, Bob made one of the greatest fake idols ever. Still to this day, it's up there with the best of them. It's a masterpiece of tactical ingenuity, and yet it gets sold short here. Bob, own your game. Own your tactical decisions. Show them that it wasn't personal and you weren't trying to be a mean person. There was strategy behind it. You had to have done something anything all season to make it this far. I can sit on my sofa for 39 days and still find something to be proud of. I think. Regardless, despite that, Bob got four votes, a majority, and won this season. So anything is possible. Sue, if coattail riding is your strategy, bravo. Because you're a coattail rider. Bob, you need to tell me something that you thought of that Sugar did and remote controlled you to do. Strategy-wise, I would say no, I, I was riding coattails. Bob, and what I want from you is one example of when you chose to be responsible for your decisions while you were out there. The occasion didn't come up. You people making good decisions. There was no point in me stepping forward and saying, no, let's not do that. Okay, well, this will be an interesting choice, that's for sure. Those are my top five worst final tribal council performances by Survivor winners. I hope you all enjoyed the vid. Let me know if there's anyone else out there that maybe should contend for being in this top five. A huge thank you to my patrons for just giving me your vote despite all the questionable things I say. And don't forget on your way out that half the game is getting to the final day. And I will see you in the next one once I realized that if this video is proof of anything, it's that in some cases, getting to the final day is perhaps everything. You started to strategically place ideas in people's heads, which is what I wanted my job to be. And when you had approached me about blindsiding James, I was like, oh no, he's catching up. So who then becomes the biggest threat to me? You. What do I have to do? Turn it around on you, who is an extremely great strategic player in your daily life. I had to get rid of my biggest strategic threat, who is you. Guys, congratulations. Well done. <laughs> James, I'm confused. What are you laughing at? Because he shut him up. I know her. I never shut him up. Well, shut honestly, up I'm in awe. <laughs> he shut his mouth. <laughs> You know, I won an immunity. Like, that, that, did you win an immunity?